Hi guys, I would like to thank everyone who donates to the Patreon account. The donations keep the show going. My computer is ready to go kaput after 8 years, so the Patreon fund will help me get another computer, and that will, in turn, enable me to churn out more episodes. There will be more giveaways in the future, and just a reminder, you don't have to give a lot. A dollar a month would do. Any amount would be appreciated. Once again, the Patreon account is located at www.patreon.com slash leader1. That's P-A-T-R-E-O-N and L-E-A-D-E-R-O-N-E. Thank you and enjoy the show. Welcome to Human Monsters. The title of this episode is Hell's Kitchen, the Morbid Menu of Chef Jeffrey Dahmer. Or to quote one of the Jeffrey Dahmer memes, a sandwich is a sandwich, but a manwich is a meal. Jeffrey Lionel Dahmer was born on May 21, 1960. His parents were Lionel and Joyce. They were described as a typical and normal middle-class family. They lived in a suburb of Milwaukee, Wisconsin, called West Alice. Jeffrey's father was frequently absent. Lionel pursued his chemistry degree at Marquette University. When he wasn't in school, he was focusing on his studies at home while writing a dissertation. As a result, he neglected his relationships with his wife and son. He assured her everything would be better once he finished school. Not only would he be more available, but he would score a high-paying position and their level of material security would receive a boost. Years later, Lionel acknowledged his negligence and the deep remorse he felt. Joyce was physically present, but she experienced difficulty bonding with Jeffrey. Lionel has noted that it was a troubled pregnancy, and she suffered from postpartum depression. Jeffrey has denied that his family and domestic life were in any way responsible for his criminal behavior. As he said during an interview in prison, my childhood wasn't filled with any great tragedies or anything. There were good times and there were bad times. I think it was fairly normal. Conditions may not have been ideal in the Dahmer household, but to quote Jeffrey, It really wasn't a terrible childhood, though. Joyce and Lionel's marriage gradually disintegrated due to all the time Lionel spent on his degree. They fought constantly, and their relationship became devoid of sexual intimacy. In 1962, Lionel moved his family to Ames, Iowa, to study for his Ph.D. at Iowa State University. In 1966, Lionel earned its Ph.D. and obtained an academic position in Akron, Ohio. This meant that the family would be geographically and financially stable. Joyce and Lionel's marriage saw some improvement. There was less fighting, and their second son was born that same year. Joyce and Lionel invited Jeffrey to name his baby brother. He named him David. This newfound domestic harmony was short-lived. Shortly after David's birth, Joyce and Lionel moved into separate bedrooms. They were fighting again, and with vintage regularity. Jeffrey Dahmer's deviant behavior first began after his family moved to Ohio. He developed an obsession with dead animals. He did not kill these animals. On one occasion, he and Lionel found an injured bird in their yard, and they nursed it back to health before releasing it back to the wild. 
Dahmer's interest in animals had more to do with what made them tick. He wanted to see what they looked like on the inside. Whenever he found a dead animal, he would bring it home for dissection. Lionel was not disturbed by this. Having a scientific background, he was happy to see that Jeffrey took an interest in biology. Before this, young Jeffrey did not have any real hobbies or passions for anything. He was a mediocre student. Lionel was happy to assist Jeffrey, at one point teaching him how to bleach animal bones safely. There was one occasion when Jeffrey did demonstrate malice toward an animal. He once gave a bucket of tadpoles to a teacher. The teacher thanked him, but re-gifted the tadpoles to another student. Jeffrey was outraged and hurt by this gesture. As revenge, he dumped motor oil in the bucket, effectively killing all the tadpoles. Jeffrey pursued his secondary education at Revere High School in Bath, Ohio. He was a loner, with little in the way of close friendships. Some have said he was a recluse, but he refuted this claim, saying, With my friends in school, we had a good social life, so I wasn't so extremely reclusive and self-centered. He was remembered by peers as being intelligent, polite, and having a penchant for practical jokes, which became known as doing a Dahmer. He participated in extracurricular activities at school, like band and the tennis team, but these did not reflect his true passions. What he most enjoyed was drinking, playing pranks, and dissecting animals. Jeffrey's favorite class was biology. He was more fascinated than ever with the inner workings of anatomy. And Lionel continued to mentor him in his pursuit of this knowledge. As in most biology classes, dissection of animals was part of the curriculum. Jeffrey recalls his experience with this activity. In ninth grade, in biology class, we had the usual dissection of fetal pigs. I took the remains of that home and kept the skeleton of it, and I just started branching out. Dogs cats. I suppose it could have turned into a normal hobby like taxidermy, but it didn't. It veered off into this. Why, I don't know. Jeffrey's reaction to the innards of dissected animals was not purely relegated to the domain of intellectual stimulation. As he recalled years later, there was a general excitement for me. It became a compulsion and it switched from animals to humans. His interest in the interiors of human anatomy triggered first sexual arousal, then homicidal impulses. Jeffrey was distressed by these reactions. He knew it was abnormal, and he was unable to cope. It was not something he could discuss with his school's guidance counselor or his parents. He found a way to cope, but it was neither helpful nor constructive. He drowned his despair and self-loathing in alcohol. It got to the point where he would bring alcoholic beverages to school and become inebriated throughout the day. He even managed to sneak a drink while class was in session on a few occasions. His teachers weren't aware of it, but his peers knew. They never bothered him about it. When one of his classmates asked him why he drank so much, he said, It's my medicine. He was caught drinking on school property once. He only received a warning. Another issue with which he was struggling to cope was his burgeoning homosexuality. His family were typical Midwestern conservatives, and he feared that they would disown him if they found out he was gay. He did not come out of the closet to his parents at that time. He was never in denial about his sexual orientation, and he didn't try to go straight to please his parents. But he still kept it a secret from them and from most of his peers. He had his first sexual encounter with another male at the age of 14. It was typical as those experiences go. 
His secret fantasies about men were anything but typical. He became fascinated by BDSM activity. To quote Dahmer, Age 14 or 15, I started having obsessive thoughts of violence intermingled with sex. It just got worse and worse. I never dreamed it would become a reality. These fantasies became obsessions, and they drove him to distraction. Sometimes they pulled him down deep into the netherworld under the epidermis. At the age of 16, Jeffrey Dahmer was no longer ambivalent about his sexuality, with all its nefarious pathology. He could only enjoy a male body the way he wanted, with violence as foreplay. He was apprehensive at first. He was a novice as a criminal, and otherwise devoid of an aggressive temperament. He had to figure out how to bring himself to kill. Only by bringing about the demise of another could he feel truly alive. There was a young man who went jogging along the same route near Jeffrey's house every day. He found the jogger attractive and decided he would be the first of his prey. The problem was, every time he would edge closer to the jogger, he would lose his nerve. He didn't value the young man's life, but he did fear him. It also didn't help that he still lived at home with his parents, which would make it nearly impossible to commit such an offense undetected. He continued to play pranks at school most of which were harmless fun and offensive to few. He did raise a few eyebrows when he started drawing chalk outlines of human bodies in the hallways, though. 1978. Jeffrey Dahmer graduated from high school. This wasn't the only ending in his life that year. Lionel and Joyce finally threw in the towel on their marriage. Lionel moved out of the house. Joyce did the same, taking David with her. Jeffrey spent that summer alone in their house. This solitude was exactly what Jeffrey wanted. He was alone to drink as much as he wanted and to dream about raping and murdering men. He lived in his own world, and there was no risk of suspicion or censure from others. June 18th. Jeffrey began drinking in the morning. His supply of alcohol began to run low by late afternoon. He went to the store to buy more liquor and beer. As he drove back to the house, he was distracted by the sight of a young male hitchhiker and nearly crashed the car. The man was so appealing to him he couldn't pass him up. He pulled over and offered the man a ride. The man's name was Stephen Hicks, and he was 18 years old. His destination was Cleveland, where he looked forward to attending a rock concert. He was hoping to commute straight to the venue, but somehow Dahmer was able to persuade him to join him for a beer at his house before resuming his trip. Stephen was not gay, but Dahmer was charming and charismatic enough to win him over. Dahmer was especially taken with Stephen's bare chest. It was very warm that day, and Stephen took his shirt off. Sex appeal was always an advantage to a hitchhiker looking to attract the attention of motorists. As the men drank at Dahmer's house, Stephen became tipsy, while Dahmer secretly formulated a plan to experiment on his darkest sexual fantasies with Stephen as his first guinea pig. Dahmer couldn't believe his good luck, as he noted years later. It just seemed so bizarre to me that this obsession that I had been thinking and wanting just... All the parts are there, and they make it possible to make it happen. The way he saw it, all he had to do was get Stephen drunk enough to weaken his ability and will to fight back. Another advantage Dahmer had was his physique... He was six foot tall and a weightlifter. Hicks had had enough. He still had a concert to attend. He tried to leave, and Dahmer tried to stop him. 
Hicks was also very athletic, and he pushed Dahmer away. If he thought this was all it took to get Dahmer off his back, he was mistaken. After he turned his back and headed toward the door, Dahmer clubbed him in the back of his head with a ten-pound dumbbell. Hicks was dead upon impact. Dahmer finally had a dead young man all to himself. His dream had finally come true. At first, all Dahmer did was lay down beside Hicks' corpse and masturbate. He has insisted that necrophilia never entered into the equation with Stephen Hicks. After relieving himself of the sexual arousal, he went to work cleaning up the scene of the crime. He enjoyed this as much as the murder itself. After dragging Hicks' corpse to a bathroom, he placed it in the bathtub. It was an ideal spot for dissection. For hours, he dismantled Stephen Hicks with a butcher knife. He was as methodical as he had been with fetal pigs in biology class. He was achingly hard as he dug deeper and deeper into Stephen Hicks' cadaver. It was as if he hadn't masturbated at all. Nothing turned him on like this. He found his soulmate in a body whose soul had departed. Dahmer was having the time of his life. There was only one problem. Well, there were many problems, as society would have seen it, but only one that troubled Dahmer personally. Lionel was due to pay a visit soon. Jeffrey buried the components of Stephen Hicks' remains in the crawl space under the house. When he returned to Stephen's corpse, he dissolved the softer parts in acid. When they were soft and pliable enough, he flushed them down the toilet. He smashed the bones into bits with a sledgehammer. He scattered the smithereens around the woods surrounding his home. Lionel moved back into the house, which compelled Jeffrey to leave. Otherwise, there was no way he could act on his fantasies. With his first taste, he was hooked. To quote Dahmer, Once it happened the first time, it just seemed like it had control of my life from there on in. Lionel and Jeffrey did not get along during this period. Lionel was dismayed by Jeffrey's alcoholism, poor housekeeping, unkempt appearance, and lack of ambition. He offered to pay for his tuition and other expenses should he attend Ohio State University. Jeffrey agreed to do this, and he went, majoring in business. He found it difficult to focus on his studies when all he was motivated to do was drink alone in his dorm room and fantasize about murdering and dissecting other young men. Jeffrey's academic performance and personal condition continued to deteriorate. One day when Lionel paid a surprise visit, he was deeply disappointed with what he saw. Jeffrey's room was littered with innumerable beer cans and liquor bottles. He was not applying himself to his studies. Lionel decided that drastic measures must be taken to ensure his son did not waste his life. He persuaded him to enlist in the military. Jeffrey joined the army. After completing basic training, he was stationed first in Alabama, then in San Antonio, Texas. He had his sights set on a career as a military policeman, but the administration decided to employ him as a combat medic. If only they had known just how much this would have meant to a man who was fixated on dead bodies. He was always keen to meet meat. Wounded soldiers, dead or dying, had a special place in his heart, if he had one. The stars were aligning. His service was highly rated, and his problem drinking was significantly reduced. Dahmer was transferred to Baumholder, West Germany. The old Jeffrey Dahmer, the real Jeffrey Dahmer, returned with a vengeance. He began drinking heavily again. He lived a semi-reclusive existence when he wasn't working. His service rating was plummeting. It didn't help that he began to sexually harass and abuse other personnel. 
One man from Arkansas, Billy Joe Capshaw, was unfortunate enough to live in the same barracks as Jeffrey Dahmer. Capshaw reported that Dahmer's sexual impropriety began almost immediately. To quote Capshaw, I had probably been raped eight to ten times. I don't know. He was tying me to the bunk with motor pool rope. He took all my clothing from me. He would either beat me before he raped me, or he would beat me after. Capshaw said he didn't report these incidents because he assumed at the time that his commanding officers wouldn't have believed him. He also felt it would bring shame to his family. As Capshaw put it, I could not say I was raped. I could not do that to my daddy. He fought in the Pacific. Another man, Preston Davis, resided at the same base as Jeffrey Dahmer at that time. He was a fellow combat medic. One day while they were engaged in a training exercise, Dahmer drugged and raped him in an armored vehicle, or so Davis believes. This incident was reported to an officer, but the incident was not documented or investigated, nor was there any disciplinary action taken against Dahmer. It does not appear on his service record. After a series of warnings and reprimands due to his heavy drinking, Jeffrey Dahmer was discharged as private first class in March 1981. He was given a one-way ticket to anywhere in the United States. Jeffrey Dahmer was down in spirits. He felt ashamed about getting fired from the military. He couldn't bring himself to inform his parents about it. So he chose to fly to Miami instead of Wisconsin. He disliked the cold winters of the Midwest, so Miami appealed to him in terms of its tropical climate. As he got settled, Dahmer was hired by Delhi and rented a room in a boarding house by the beach. Though he enjoyed the sun and the ocean, it wasn't long before his sinister and self-destructive tendencies re-emerged. He began drinking heavily, and it affected his work performance to such a degree that he was fired. He wasn't bothered by this. He hated the job, and he was happy to have more time to drink on the beach and admire young male bodies. This didn't last long. By summer 1981, his military discharge money ran out because he spent most of his money on alcohol. He had no money to pay his rent. He was evicted from his room and lived as a vagrant. Desperate and with few other alternatives, he contacted Lionel for help. Lionel invited him to return to their house in Ohio. Things were very different in Lionel Dahmer's household this time. He remarried, and Jeffrey was expected to fall in line with Lionel's expectations. He was to curtail his drinking, find a job, and provide assistance around the house when needed. Jeffrey was cooperative at first, but the real Jeffrey Dahmer could not be repressed for long. Instead of looking for employment, Jeffrey was drinking in parks and bars. He kept a large stash of liquor in the house, which was hidden from Lionel and his wife. They confronted him about it, and he vowed to throw it all out. The situation did not improve, and it came to a head when Jeffrey was arrested for drunk and disorderly conduct. He had been wandering around town drunk and harassing people. Lionel couldn't take it anymore, and he dispatched Jeffrey to live with his grandmother in suburban Milwaukee, the district of West Allis. Lionel felt that helping her with chores and providing her with companionship would give Jeffrey a sense of direction and a motivating factor in his life. Jeffrey honored the obligations expected of him at his grandmother's house, even going so far as to accompany his grandmother to church. He did continue to drink to excess, however. After a lengthy search, Jeffrey Dahmer landed a job, and it couldn't have possibly been more appropriate. He was hired to work as a phlebotomist at the Milwaukee Blood Plasma Center. 
Where it bleeds, it pours, and his training and experience as an army medic impressed the recruiting staff. His position was eliminated ten months later, but not before he managed to steal a vial of human blood and drink it at home. This little taste left him yearning for more. After two more years of unemployment, he was hired by the Ambrosia Chocolate Factory. He would work there for the next nine years. With more money to buy alcohol, Dahmer spent much of the summer of 1982 drinking in Milwaukee's public parks. He continued to wrestle with his demons, but toward the end of that season, at the onset of autumn's decay, he lost the battle. August 7th, 1982. Jeffrey Dahmer was arrested for a sex crime. It was his first documented offense of this kind, and it wouldn't be the last. He was drunk and wandered into the Wisconsin State Fair, which was situated just down the street from his grandmother's house. He was on the prowl. All the children and happy, well-adjusted nuclear families were unaware that a sexual predator was in their midst. They would soon be assured that this was unequivocally true. Feeling it would relieve him of his sexual tension, Jeffrey Dahmer dropped his pants and exposed himself to a mixed crowd, which included children. The charge of indecent exposure was reduced to drunk and disorderly conduct. He paid a $50 fine, and that was that. It was not a lesson learned. He had only taken his first step along his path as a sex offender. Dahmer soon realized that a way to relieve himself of his sex drive without the fallout of legal transgressions was to make the rounds of Milwaukee's gay bars, adult bookstores, and bath clubs. The sex itself was not enough to satisfy Dahmer. What he wanted most was complete control over and possession of a man. He decided the only way to achieve this was to ply his sex partners with sleeping pills so that they would be unconscious and thereby completely submissive. Like with his problem drinking, a little was never enough and a lot only left him starving for more. He practiced this at the bathhouses and it met with disapproval by his fellow members who valued consent. He was reported by several of his victims, and his membership at Club Baths was terminated in 1987. Gossip in Milwaukee's gay community spread about, quote, the guy who was slipping Mickeys, end quote, at bath clubs. He was eventually blackballed from all the other bathhouses. It was an inconvenience to be sure, but he would find another way to satiate his sexual desires. One night, Dahmer was drunk and wandering aimlessly through the streets of Milwaukee. At one point, he spotted a male mannequin in the display window of a storefront. He found the face and physique of the mannequin attractive. The best part? The mannequin was inert. Dahmer never wanted to be dominated, nor did he want reciprocation. That mannequin had nothing to offer but its inherent aesthetic value, and that was just fine by Jeffrey Dahmer. Nothing was sexier to him than immobility. Dahmer said it best, I trained myself to view people as objects of pleasure instead of people. There was only one way to obtain his artificial companion. He smashed the window and took the mannequin to his grandmother's house. At one point, his grandmother discovered the mannequin, and she was so disturbed, she demanded he throw it out. He agreed to get rid of it, but he implored her to keep it a secret from Lionel. One day, Jeffrey was having breakfast with his grandmother and perusing the newspaper. Naturally, he was reading the obituaries. At some point, he was struck by a thunderbolt of inspiration. 
he would find a young man who had recently perished and enjoy his body as a necrophiliac. He didn't want to have to kill the man, just take the baton from the Grim Reaper. The more he thought about it, the harder he became. This was Blue Ball's territory. Now what he needed was the perfect specimen. He browsed through the obituaries like it was a Sears catalog to find the Ken doll of corpses. He settled on an 18-year-old who was buried near his grandmother's house. In the middle of the night, he went to the cemetery and started digging. It didn't go well. He didn't bring a pickaxe with him to chop up any hard-packed soil and rock. He only had a shovel, and he was unsuccessful in digging all the way down. Jeffrey Dahmer was no Ed Gein. He considered breaking into a morgue, but he lacked the criminal expertise to carry out a successful invasion. It was a frustrating period for him. As he recalled to a reporter, there just wasn't an opportunity to fully express what I wanted to do. There was just not the physical opportunity to do it then. September 6th, 1986. Jeffrey Dahmer was highly inebriated and walked to the shore of the Kinnick River, also known to locals as the KK River. He was on the prowl. If there were candidates for murder and necrophilia, he was determined to find them. He found a couple of young boys playing. He drew their attention and then pulled down his pants. He masturbated for their benefit. They did not benefit. In fact, they were frightened by this display and reported Dahmer's conduct to the police. After he finished drinking and left the general vicinity of the riverbank, he was approached and questioned by police. Dahmer was charged with lewd and lascivious behavior. He could have served time, but the charge was reduced to disorderly conduct. He was slapped with a small fine and a year of probation. The conditions of probation were not restrictive. He seldom had to report to a probation officer, and they never visited his grandmother's house. As with the police and the courts, Jeffrey was able to use his gift of gab to convince his family that his run-ins with the law were nothing to worry about. He told them that he was urinating into the river when the boys saw his penis and that the boys misunderstood what they were seeing. He told them he would never intentionally offend in front of or against children. Dahmer was free to hunt for victims once more. He may have been blackballed from the bathhouses, but the doors were still open at the gay bars, and there was always action at the parks. This butcher saw Milwaukee's gay scene as a slaughterhouse, and he was keen to supplement his diet with as much protein as possible. September 15, 1987. Jeffrey Dahmer met his second Steve in Steve Tuomi. He met him at Club 219. After having a few drinks, Dahmer suggested they adjourn to a motel. They ended up going to the Ambassador Hotel. The men drank for several hours, becoming so intoxicated that Dahmer blacked out. The only thing he remembered in the morning about the night before was that it ended with him passing out before he could slip Steve a mickey. He drew a blank when it came to the rest of the evening. Whatever transpired, it left Steve's lifeless body behind. His chest had been crushed. Blood had been pouring out of his mouth. The alcohol put the conscious Jeffrey Dahmer to sleep so that the monster within could awaken. Dahmer panicked. It's not that he was remorseful about what he had done to Stephen. Far from it. He was just terrified of facing the music. How was he going to transport this corpse out of the hotel without arousing suspicion? After having a cup of coffee to clear his mind, he came up with a plan to conceal the evidence. He placed a Do Not Disturb handle sign on the doorknob outside of the room. He went to a store that sold suitcases and bought the largest model available. 
large enough to carry the remains of an adult male. He was realistic enough to accept the possibility that the case might not be big enough to contain Stephen. Should that have been the outcome, he decided the only thing to do would be to dismantle him in the bathtub. When he entered the room, he took another look at Stephen's corpse. Comparing the dimensions of the suitcase and Stephen's body, he was relieved to find that they were compatible. He had to work quickly. It was a relay race with rigor mortis as his opponent, and he had to get Stephen into that suitcase while he was still flexible. As he contorted Stephen's limbs into the suitcase, his reflection passed in and out of the young man's eyeballs. Absent was the look of horror with which he would have presented had he experienced subjectively what Dahmer was doing to his remains. Stephen Tuomi had become a toy. That was exactly what Dahmer wanted him to be, an inanimate object that would not fight back or insist upon accommodation of its feelings and sensibilities. With Stephen Tuomi packed into a suitcase, he was conquered and controlled. Dahmer didn't get to savor the state of affairs just yet. He didn't own a car, so transporting the corpse under the radar of anybody with an eye for the obvious would be the ultimate act of subterfuge, one that required the collaboration of the forces of timing and serendipity. There was no alternative but to drag the body downstairs to the street and call a cab. Dahmer was very strong due to his weightlifting regimen, but Stephen Tuomi's dead weight was a workout for which he was unprepared. He had to ask the driver of the taxi to help put the suitcase in the trunk, and then again to help him drag it into his grandmother's house. That cabbie sure earned his tip on that fare. If only he had known that he earned his living that hour from transmitting human remains. Timing was on Dahmer's side. His grandmother was asleep when he brought the corpse in the house. He was excited to get to work dismembering the cadaver. He chose the basement as his workshop. Whether he dragged the corpse down the stairs or passed the wheel to gravity and let him roll and bounce down the stairs, banging his head against the wall, may never be known. Stephen Tuomi was splayed out on the basement floor, naked and lifeless. Vulnerable to Jeffrey Dahmer, who was free to do whatever he wanted with his corpse. No limits. No boundaries. No shame. No morals. No laws. It was go time. He was rock hard and inserted his cock into Stephen's ass. Rigor mortis can set in as soon as four hours after death, so Stephen's rectum was likely tighter than ever. Dahmer pressed faster and harder against the pressure brought down upon his cock by the stiffened muscles. When he climaxed, he came on Stephen's exterior. He would have come inside him, but he was too smart not to know by then that sperm is the ultimate DNA evidence after blood. He had been fingerprinted when he was arrested for his sex crimes, so he had to be extra cautious. He had this all figured out. After he was finished fucking the corpse, he collapsed on the floor and just rested there. It was the phase that might normally facilitate pillow talk, but Stephen had nothing to contribute. Jeffrey Dahmer's grandmother was quite old, and her health had seen better days, but she wasn't immobile. She could have gone into the basement any time. He had to dissect Stephen's carcass without delay. The procedure typically took hours. With the dissection methodology he learned from his father and biology class, Along with his experience dissecting Stephen Hicks, he was more confident in his abilities. He was prepared to carry out this undertaking with considerably more efficiency. He first sliced the flesh and muscles off the bones. The flesh and muscle was easier and faster to dispose of. 
Time is never on your side when you've killed someone and need to dispose of their remains. If their corpse starts to stink and you don't live alone, you may not be able to count on your roommate to be morally negotiable enough to keep that information hidden from the authorities. He put the flesh and muscle into garbage bags. He placed the garbage bags in the cans with the regular garbage. The remains of livestock and human flesh lying in wait side by side to be picked up by a waste collector. The next step was to smash the bones. He broke them into pieces and smashed the pieces, crushing them into smaller and smaller particles until they were converted into powder. He flushed the powder down the toilet. Hours later, with a garbage can as his coffin outside, there were no obvious traces of Stephen Tuomi left inside of Jeffrey Dahmer's house. What Dahmer did was wrong, but he did it right. After cleaning up some lasting debris from the floor, it was as if Stephen Tuomi's corpse had never been there. Dahmer did keep a couple of souvenirs, however. He kept Stephen's penis, testicles, and head. Utilizing the bleaching techniques taught to him by his father to preserve the head, he placed it in a box for safekeeping. He loved to take it out occasionally and admire his handiwork. Eventually, the head would be used for masturbatory purposes, but that came later. No pun intended. Dahmer's family became suspicious about his nocturnal lifestyle and activities, though they didn't suspect him of being a murderer, necrophile, and cannibal, not even with the mummified head and genitals of Stephen Tuomi in Jeffrey's closet, of which they were unaware at the time. Lionel was as worried and suspicious as the rest of the family, and he took drastic measures. Assuming that his alcoholism was the problem, he searched Jeffrey's bedroom for booze and any indicators of illegal and or immoral activity. After rifling through his closet, he found the box that contained the head. It was locked. As Lionel reflected years later, it was about a one-foot square box, metal and wood box, that I thought contained pornographic material. My mother, I didn't want her to come into contact with any of that stuff. Lionel confronted Jeff about his lifestyle and behavior as of late. Jeffrey feared that Lionel saw Stephen Tuomi's remains. He refused to disclose the contents of the box protesting instead that his right to privacy was violated. When this did not suffice for Lionel, Jeffrey refused to speak with him any longer and went to his room. Still, Jeffrey knew Lionel wouldn't give up so easily. He opened the box and replaced it with pornographic magazines, most of which were oriented towards heterosexuality, since his family did not yet know he was gay. To quote Lionel, the next morning, he came down from upstairs and showed me there was pornographic literature in there. And I said, okay, get rid of it. I didn't realize what was in that box. Though Jeffrey Dahmer was anxious to remain one step ahead of the law, he also didn't want anybody to throw a roadblock in front of him in his quest to murder, defile, dissect, and dine on men. The denouement of that story was nowhere in sight. As Dahmer put it years later, after the second time it seemed like the compulsion to do it was too strong, and I didn't even try to stop it after that. 1988. Jeffrey Dahmer was now a slave to his homicidal impulses, and he couldn't feed the beast enough to keep it satisfied. He went to Club 219 in January to find his next victim. Before he darkened the front door, he met 14-year-old James Doxtator, a prostitute who was peddling himself around the corner from the club. After settling business matters, Doxtator accompanied Dahmer to his grandmother's house. 
The plan was he would pose for nude photos and have a few drinks with Dahmer. Dahmer managed to sneak James into his grandmother's house without attracting her attention. They went to Jeffrey's room to have sex and drink beer. What James didn't know was that Dahmer spiked his beer with sleeping pills. Once Dahmer was assured that James was asleep, he strangled him to death. He spread his legs apart until his rectum was gaping. Dahmer drove himself into the boy's dead body. James's corpse slid back and forth along the floor as Dahmer thrusted back and forth to a climax. He took James Ductator's cadaver down to the basement and dismembered it with his customary precision and detachment. Like all his other victims, James Doctator's humanity was stripped from him in Jeffrey Dahmer's crosshairs. Another specimen from Club 219 suffered the same fate about two months later. Dahmer's grandmother became increasingly annoyed by his lifestyle. She also complained of a foul odor that emanated from the basement and garage. She also didn't care to see him bringing in the endless succession of young men into his room late at night. He was still an alcoholic, and that in and of itself nettled her to no end. Killing did not fulfill Dahmer to the degree that he would no longer have to fill the void inside of him with booze. The more he killed, the more he drank. He left beer cans and liquor bottles all over his room and in the basement. She had had enough of all this and gave him an ultimatum. Quit drinking or find a new place to live. He told her he would reform his behavior, and she believed him, thereby rescinding the threat of displacement. Little changed, however, and even after Lionel intervened, Jeffrey Dahmer could only be Jeffrey Dahmer. In late September 1988, Jeffrey and his grandmother agreed that it was time for him to move out. Dahmer moved into an apartment at 808 North 24th Street. The neighborhood was indigent and rife with crime, but it was conveniently located close to the Ambrosia Chocolate Factory. None of these considerations mattered much to him, however. All he cared about was killing, fucking, and dissecting attractive young men with no interruption or intervention from his father and grandmother. He wasted no time. The night after he got settled, he met a 13-year-old boy who was to his liking. He told him he would pay him $50 to pose nude for photographs in his apartment. Dahmer gave him a drink while he was there. After taking a few sips, the boy began to feel nauseous. Not exorcist nauseous, but queasy enough to put an end to the night's festivities and leave. When he arrived home, his parents were concerned about the impact on their son's body. They took him to a hospital. Poisons were pumped out of his stomach. The doctors contacted the police. By the time officers arrived at Dahmer's apartment to arrest him, he was at work. They arrested him at the factory. Dahmer was charged with exploitation of a minor with second-degree sexual assault. There was potential for him to do serious time for this offense. He pleaded not guilty and paid a $2,500 fine. The plaintiff was considered credible, and the offending sleeping pills were found in Dahmer's apartment. Dahmer had no previous felony convictions, and he was gainfully employed, so his attorney was able to secure him a plea bargain. It stipulated that he would plead guilty to felony sexual assault. He was convicted and slapped with an eight-year prison sentence, which was mostly suspended. He was still required to serve a year in county jail. He was placed on probation for five years and required to register as a sex offender. With his stint in jail looming, he was forced to move back into his grandmother's house. 
She told him he was not to drink alcohol or bring men home. He assured her he would comply, but they were just words. March 29th, 1989. Jeffrey Dahmer met Anthony Sears at a gay bar. Sears supplemented his income as a model. Dahmer offered him money to pose for his amateur photography. Sears accepted. When they arrived at Dahmer's grandmother's house, she was asleep. Dahmer and Sears had a few drinks. They had consensual sex. At some point, a powerful sedative infiltrated Anthony's system, and he became unconscious. Dahmer ensured he would never wake up. Dahmer dismembered Sears in the basement. Like with the others, he flushed his muscles and organs down the toilet and smashed his bones with a hammer. He decided to keep his head and genitalia as keepsakes. All this happened before his sentencing hearing, so he had to store the head and genitals at another location. Dahmer was granted a work release, that is, he worked shifts at the Ambrosia Chocolate Factory, but was required to report to jail at the end of every shift. Dahmer stored his belongings in a locker at the factory, and among them were Anthony Sears' head, dick, and balls. Jeffrey Dahmer was a model prisoner, and as a reward for his good behavior, he was given a 12-hour furlough to spend Thanksgiving with his family in 1989. At least that's what the administration of the jail were led to believe he was doing. In truth, he went to a bar. He haunted Milwaukee's gay bars looking for someone to satisfy his dark urges. In the process, he became blackout drunk. Next thing Dahmer knew, somebody was cramming a candlestick up his ass, feeling the metal sliding in and out without lubrication, was not what he had in mind for the evening. Call it rape. Call it his just desserts. He returned to jail several hours late, but he was not disciplined. Two weeks later, he wrote a letter to the judge who passed down his sentence. He asked for an early release. After reviewing the case carefully, the judge decided Dahmer was not a threat to the community. 1990. Jeffrey Dahmer was not allowed at his grandmother's after being released. He had saved enough money while in jail to rent a new apartment. In May, he moved into the Oxford Apartments on 924 North 25th Street. He worked the late shift at the factory and slept during the day. He was polite to his neighbors but largely kept to himself. Dahmer's idea of a housewarming party was to bring Anthony Sears' head home from work. That was half the fun. After having a few beers, he went out to the gay bars. He met 32-year-old Raymond Smith, a hustler. He invited him back to his apartment. After sodomizing him, he violated him from the inside, and Anthony was dead. Dahmer explained in an interview the methodology involved in luring his victims into his apartment. I'd go to the nightclubs, drink, watch the striptease shows, and if I didn't meet anyone at the bars, I'd go to the bath clubs and meet someone there, offer them money, and we'd go back to the apartment and have a few drinks. I'd have the sleeping pills mixture already prepared. The person would drink it, fall asleep. That's when they would be strangled. He had begun to store his victim's body parts at this point. This necessitated an upgrade in security. Locks on the doors would not suffice. To quote Dahmer, I bought security systems and installed them myself in the apartment. I had a video camera in the corner of the room. Installed locks in the doors sirens and stuff in case anyone broke into the apartment. He took these precautions to prevent escape as much as invasion. 
The process of preparing these articles turned him on. He would be rock hard while stripping flesh from bones. He found calf and arm muscles especially desirable. He would hold one of these muscles in one hand and masturbate with the other, like men used to do with pornographic magazines. By this point, he was regularly eating parts of his victims. He preserved testicles in jars, like pickles. If he was feeling peckish, he might decide to fry a bicep. Heads, penises, torsos, and other body parts were neatly arranged and stored in the refrigerator. He wanted to possess the muscles at the deepest level possible. He wanted to make them a part of him. Dahmer said it best, I was branching out. That's when the cannibalism started. Eating the heart and the arm muscle was a way of making me feel they were a part of me. He insisted that it was less about the taste of the meat and more about gratifying himself sexually. To quote Dahmer, It made me feel like they were a permanent part of me. It gave me a sexual satisfaction to do that. One thing that was always a turn-off for Dahmer was when his victims moved around during sex. He came up with a solution. He would find a way to turn his living victims into zombies. He liked the warmth he encountered in the living. He didn't kill for the sake of it. He killed as a means to an end. It is not possible to create zombies in real life, but this didn't stop Dahmer from taking a stab at creating them. It is not possible to create zombies in real life, but this didn't stop Dahmer from taking a stab at creating them. I tried to keep the person alive by inducing a zombie-like state by first injecting dilute acid solution into their brain or hot water, and it never did completely work. Dahmer's zombies would live a few more hours and then die, much to his disappointment. He was hoping to have them around for as long as possible before the thrill it was gone and he could move on to another victim. Ultimately, he had to come up with another way to retain them on a semi-permanent basis. Photography was a virtual time capsule for his homicidal activities. He would take pictures of his victims at varied stages of dissection and decomposition. To quote Dahmer, It was my way of remembering their appearance, their physical beauty. I also wanted to keep, if I couldn't keep them with me whole, at least I felt that I could keep their skeletons. I even went so far as planning on setting up an altar with the ten different skulls and skeletons, a sort of memorial. After being released from jail in May 1990, Dahmer killed four more men. He continued to experiment with their bodies, but he did not always get the results he hoped for. When he killed Raymond Smith, he put his skeleton in his freezer and left it there for months. It did not end up embrittled to his satisfaction, so he put it in a container of acid so it would dissolve. He put his skull in the oven to dry it out. Instead, it exploded. Dahmer was angry that so much of Smith's body had gone to waste. Determined to do it right the next time, he went to the gay bars in search of new prey. September Jeffrey Dahmer met 22-year-old Ernest Miller on the street. He lured Miller to his apartment with promises of alcohol and $50. It gave Miller a spiked beverage. Dahmer suddenly realized that he didn't put enough of the pills in the drink to knock Miller out. As Miller sat on the couch drinking, Dahmer came up from behind and wrapped his arm around him. Miller was unable to break from his grip. Dahmer stabbed Miller in his carotid artery. He bled profusely. He lost so much blood, he was dead in minutes. Dahmer felt empowered and energized by having brought about the man's demise without the use of chemical sedatives. He spent a lot of quality time with Miller's corpse. He was very taken with the man's beauty, 
more so than with most of the other victims. He sodomized the corpse to completion. Having climaxed, he took photos of Miller's body. Now that he enjoyed Ernest Miller from the outside, it was time to delve deeper. He dissected his body and set aside his favorite parts for later use. He was very keen on his biceps. He stored them with his heart. They would become snacks. He detached the head from the body and stripped the flesh from the bones. He placed all the severed parts in his refrigerator. He painted Miller's head and treasured it as if it were a trophy. Jeffrey Dahmer wasn't finished killing, it far from it. Killing only made him want to kill more. He couldn't kill fast enough for his liking. He was obsessed with finding more victims. His feverish quest drove him to distraction to such a degree that he would sometimes get careless. September 24, 1990 Jeffrey Dahmer went to Grand Avenue Mall. He initially didn't plan to kill anyone, but after drinking a few beers, his killer instincts began to emerge. After speaking with a few young men, he met 24-year-old David Thomas. Unlike the other men Dahmer fancied, Thomas was not gay. He had a child. He declined Dahmer's offer of free alcohol. When Dahmer offered to pay him to pose for his personal pornography collection, he accepted. He was indigent and struggling to provide for his child's needs. Having succeeded in knocking David Thomas out with drugs, the man lied there before him. Dahmer suddenly realized he was not attracted to the man enough to bugger his corpse. He also had no interest in preserving his body parts for keepsakes and meals. He considered letting him go, but then he recalled what happened when he freed the 13-year-old boy. Dahmer decided there was no recourse but to murder David Thomas. He did take some photos of Thomas's remains as he killed and dismantled him. Dahmer regretted this murder. It wasn't because of the pain he caused to David Thomas's loved ones. Dahmer wasn't capable of that kind of remorse. He regretted it because he had taken a huge risk when he killed him, and he didn't get to enjoy the body parts in the way he had with the others. Hence, Jeffrey Dahmer entered a cooling phase. Eventually, Dahmer returned to the gay bars in search of another man to kill, defile, disassemble, and feast upon. In the meantime, he attended to his hobby of dissecting his previous victims and arranging them into an altar. He became enamored of the film The Exorcist Part 3. The movie depicts demons that possess people and compel them to commit murder, often integrating extremely painful methods of torture. Dahmer recalled the effect the film had on him. I felt so helplessly evil and perverted that I actually derived a sort of pleasure from watching that tape. Watching his favorite movie and caressing his skulls was just masturbatory for him at that point. He was determined to obtain a new casualty in his war with the living. February 1991 Jeffrey Dahmer was no longer a welcome presence in gay bars. Nobody wanted to take him up on his offer of free alcohol and financial compensation for boudoir photography. He was regarded as a bit of a joke by then. He took to the streets to find a young man that was to his liking. He met 19-year-old Curtis Strader. He offered him money to pose nude for photos. Curtis accepted the invitation and they adjourned to Dahmer's apartment. Strader was drugged. Dahmer sodomized him while he was still alive and unconscious. He was then strangled until he died. After taking Curtis's body apart, he put his severed head in his refrigerator. Six weeks later, Dahmer met 19-year-old Errol Lindsay and brought him to his apartment for drinks. 
Errol Lindsay became Jeffrey Dahmer's first zombie. After drugging him unconscious, Dahmer cut a hole in his head into which he poured muriatic acid. Unexpectedly, Lindsay woke and said, I have a headache. What time is it? Immediately after, he collapsed to the floor. Dahmer was angry that the zombie experiment was a failure. He took out his rage on Lindsay, strangling him to death. He dismembered his corpse. He kept his head, but did not strip it of flesh. He was taken with Lindsay's facial features. May 24th, after a disappointing night of the gay bars, Dahmer spotted a man named Tony Hughes. He invited him to his apartment for drinks and to pose for Polaroids. Tony Hughes would become just another skull to Jeffrey Dahmer. May 26th, Dahmer spent most of the day drinking and watching The Exorcist 3. This just didn't satisfy him. The urge to victimize another young man overtook him. He was low on money, so he couldn't afford to go to bars and pay men to pose naked for him. He decided to take to the streets in search of action that would cost him little or nothing. He met 14-year-old Conorak Synthesomphone. He was unaware that Conorak was the younger brother of a 13-year-old boy he molested. Dahmer offered him money and booze, but Synthesomphone declined. Dahmer turned on the charm and won him over. After bringing the boy into his apartment and getting settled, Dahmer spiked his beverage with sleeping pills. Conorak passed out a few minutes later. Dahmer performed fellatio on Conorak and followed up by sodomizing him. Assuming the cocktail of alcohol and sleeping pills would keep Conorak passed out for hours, Dahmer left the apartment and went out for a few drinks. Two hours later, Dahmer returned to his apartment complex. To his horror, Conorak was standing with two of Dahmer's female neighbors. He was still naked. Though he was conscious, he was so disoriented, he didn't realize he was nude. His speech was so slurred it was incoherent. His neighbors wouldn't have been able to understand him anyway because he was speaking in his mother tongue, which was Laotian. The women called 911 when they noticed that Conorak was bleeding from his anus. This is a quote from that call. I'm on 25th and State, and there's this young man. He's buck naked. He has been beaten up. He is really hurt. He needs some help. Dahmer told his neighbors that Conorak was his boyfriend and that they had simply had a row. When he tried to bring Conorak back to his apartment, one of the women ran interference. The police showed up soon after. Dahmer was questioned by the officers. He gave them the same story he gave his neighbors, that Synthesomphone was his 19-year-old boyfriend and that they had a lover's quarrel. As he told them, it's an intoxicated boyfriend of another boyfriend. The police bought this story and left. He brought Conorak back up to his apartment. Dahmer was determined that this attempt to turn a man into a zombie sex slave would work. After pinning the boy down, he took a power drill to his head and bore a hole through his skull and into his brain. Dahmer poured acid onto his brain. Like with Errol Lindsay, the body died in short order. He did not bring the plot of Night of the Living Dead to life, but he did get to add another skull to his collection. May 26th, the police paid a visit to Jeffrey Dahmer's apartment. They were investigating the disappearance of Conorak Synthesomphone. Using his charm and charisma, he managed to persuade them that they would not elicit useful information from him. Dahmer commented on how close he came to getting caught. They were actually in the apartment and there was a dead young man in the bedroom on the floor. It did shock me, but not enough to quit. 
Lionel Dahmer once commented on Jeffrey's knack for talking his way out of trouble. He fooled everyone. He fooled his probation officer, his attorney, the police. There were so many people that he fooled. Summer. Tenants of Jeffrey Dahmer's apartment building began to complain about him and his unit. The summer that year was hotter than usual, and its impact was buttressed by high levels of humidity. Dahmer's neighbors complained that foul odors were emanating from his apartment. They notified the apartment manager. They also told him they heard strange noises coming from Dahmer's unit. When he approached Dahmer with the complaints, he was told that Dahmer's refrigerator went on the fritz and the smell was produced by spoiling meat. When he received a second similar complaint, he said that his tropical fish died. Dahmer cleaned his apartment thoroughly to reduce the presence of the stench as best he could, but he didn't want to accomplish this by getting rid of his collection of human flesh and bone. Dahmer purchased a 57-gallon drum of hydrochloric acid. This would be used to dissolve organs and muscles that he had no use for. Having come so close to being arrested due to his encounter with Conorak Synthesomphone, Dahmer decided to take the show on the road. He did not own a car, so he took a Greyhound bus on his journey to Chicago. It was the least expensive form of transportation available, and he wanted to save his money for alcohol and accommodations. He attended the Gay Pride Parade on June 30th. He hoped he could lure a young man away from the festivities. He met several men, but he could not persuade them to join him on his trip back to Milwaukee. Disillusioned, he returned to the bus terminal in downtown Chicago. Suddenly his luck changed. There he met 21-year-old Matt Turner. He was delighted to learn that Matt was gay and in town to celebrate pride. Dahmer convinced him to come back with him to his apartment to pose for photos. Matt Turner was the latest addition to Dahmer's showcase of human anatomy. Jeffrey Dahmer returned to the Chicago gay scene days later. He was unknown to the locals, which made picking up men easier due to his lack of a reputation. He met 23-year-old Jeremiah Weinberger, who was partying in the district known as Boys Town. Encountering resistance at first, Dahmer turned on the charm and charisma and won him over. He brought Weinberger back with him to Milwaukee. Dahmer did not kill Jeremiah right away. They had several drinks and consensual sex. Weinberger was still alive the morning after. He told Dahmer he wanted to return to Chicago. Dahmer was enraged by this. Though he could have overpowered him, he instead acquiesced. He proposed having one last drink before they hit the road. After passing out from Dahmer's spiked beverage, Jeremiah was sodomized by Dahmer. Just as he was about to strangle him, he decided to take another shot at creating a zombie. Dahmer was convinced he would get it right somehow. He felt he would fail his way toward success, learning from his mistakes. This time, after drilling a hole through the skull, he poured freshly boiled water onto the brain. Dahmer felt that it was the acid that killed his previous victims, and not the holes he drilled into their brains. His prediction was partially correct. He turned Jeremiah Weinberger into a vegetable. When Dahmer realized that Weinberg would remain in this state, he strangled him to death. After dissecting his body in the bathtub, he stored the items of preference while dissolving the rest in acid. He put his head in the freezer. Dahmer was running out of room in his refrigerator and freezer from having stored so many body parts. It got to the point where he had no space left for conventional foodstuffs. He did not fret. He would eat a section of a victim's heart or muscle that he stored in a Ziploc bag. 
July 15th, Jeffrey Dahmer met 24-year-old Oliver Lacey in his neighborhood. Dahmer was very fond of his muscular physique. He didn't just want to admire him. He wanted to possess him. That he did. After murdering Lacey, he preserved his heart, head, and a few of his muscles. Dahmer's preoccupation with killing, dismemberment, necrophilia, and cannibalism began to affect his work performance. He was frequently late for shifts and sometimes showed up inebriated. After warnings and suspensions, his employment was terminated on July 19th. He wasn't troubled by this in the slightest. He just had more time to devote to his raison d'etre. One day he met 25-year-old Joe Braidhoft. He was unemployed and indigent. While waiting for a greyhound in downtown Milwaukee, he met Jeffrey Dahmer. Dahmer offered him a few drinks and money for a photo shoot at his apartment. Braidhoft welcomed this opportunity when no other was availed to him. Joe was not gay, but he did have consensual sex with Dahmer. After drinking a spiked beverage, Dahmer strangled him until he was dead. Joe's corpse was left to languish on Dahmer's bed for several days. When he returned to the cavern two days after the murder, Dahmer discovered that it was teeming with maggots. He severed the head, cleaned it, and placed it in the freezer with the others. He deposited the rest of the body in a drum of acid. Dahmer's drinking was out of control. His appearance was slovenly, and he was barely able to function in reality outside of his private hell, the place where he reigned as a devil. The difference between him and Satan at that point was that his victims were innocent. He got to the point where he forgot many details of the murders he committed. It made sense. It was never about murder. He just wanted to collect the anatomical components of the men to whom he was attracted. He was still able to lure men into his lair of iniquity, however. July 24, 1991. Jeffrey Dahmer met 32-year-old Tracy Edwards. Tracy was straight, but he was hard up for money, and when Dahmer offered him money to pose for photos, he found it hard to pass up. They adjourned to Dahmer's apartment. Almost as soon as they got inside, Dahmer began pressuring Edwards to disrobe. As Edwards recalled at Dahmer's trial, he said, You gonna take the photo or what? I said, I still wasn't sure yet, and he suggested the beer. Dahmer gave Tracy an unopened bottle of beer and a rum and coke. The rum and coke, of course, was spiked with a powerful sedative. Tracy took light sips from both beverages, thereby remaining awake and alert. Tracy did become a little uneasy. He noticed that Dahmer was anxious and antsy. This made Edwards anxious. Wondering what made him so uncomfortable, Tracy looked around the apartment. Something didn't sit right with him. There were stacks of boxes of muriatic acid stacked in the corner. He also noticed a foul odor. Describing his temperament at the time, Edwards said, I can't really remember, but I can kind of guess now. I can tell that he knew I was getting ready to leave because I was fixing to go. I was just going to cancel everything. Before he could leave, Dahmer tried one last trick to keep Edwards on the premises. He placed a handcuff on his wrist. Knowing he was in trouble, Edwards fought back when Dahmer tried to cuff his other wrists. He was a little more subdued when Dahmer began to brandish a large knife. Dahmer didn't cut Edwards. He placed his head on his chest. To quote Edwards, He was listening to my heart, because at a point he told me that he was going to eat my heart at that point. I hit him and ran. After hitting the street, Edwards flagged a police car at the corner of North 25th Street. 
Though the two officers he spoke with were reluctant to get involved with what they perceived to be a lover's quarrel, Edwards convinced them that it was imperative that they investigate Dahmer. When the police knocked on Dahmer's door, he turned on the charm, insisting that nothing was awry and that he and his, quote, boyfriend, end quote, just had an argument. The police did not have a warrant to search his apartment, so they were limited in their ability to act. This all changed when Tracy Edwards ran into Dahmer's bedroom, where he told them the knife was kept. One of the officers followed him in. He didn't find the knife. He found something much worse, Dahmer's Polaroids. He was shocked by what he saw as he examined the stack of photos. A decapitated body. Torsos ripped apart with exposed viscera. Corpses arranged in poses. Dahmer tried to explain the photos, but it was obvious to the police that there was no other way to interpret what they saw. They informed him they were taking him into custody. He resisted arrest at first, but soon gave in. The police called for backup and began their search of the apartment. They were horrified by what they found. When they looked in the refrigerator, they found the following. One human head. Two human hearts. A partially eaten arm muscle. Part of a torso. Miscellaneous half-eaten human organs. A tray of human blood underneath. In other areas of the apartment, they found several cleaned and polished skulls. The drums of acid were carried out by officers wearing biohazard suits. One drum contained three dismembered torsos. To quote Milwaukee County's then chief medical examiner, it was more like dismantling someone's museum than an actual crime scene. Dahmer later claimed that he felt remorse, compelling him to confess to the police. He admitted to killing 16 men. He described every murder in graphic detail, along with every act of necrophilia, cannibalism, and dissection. As Dahmer put it, It was my way of remembering their appearance, their physical beauty. I also wanted to keep... If I couldn't keep them with me whole, at least I felt that I could keep their skeletons. I even went so far as planning on setting up an altar with the ten different skulls and skeletons as a sort of memorial. He was charged at the time with 15 counts of murder. His bail was set at $1 million. Initially, Dahmer pled not guilty. He later changed his plea to not guilty by reason of insanity on January 13, 1992. Though he was diagnosed with a plethora of psychiatric disorders, he was not found to be incognizant of right and wrong. He was also found to be functional and sane, and was therefore considered fit to stand trial. February 15, 1992 The jury found Jeffrey Dahmer to be both sane and guilty. He was slapped with 15 life sentences. The time to be served amounted to a sum of 957 years. Dahmer made this statement to the court. I know society will never be able to forgive me. I know the families of the victims will never be able to forgive me for what I have done. I promise I will pray each day to ask for their forgiveness when the hurt goes away, if ever. I have seen their tears and if I could give my life right now to bring their loved ones back, I would do it. The loved ones of the victims questioned his sincerity. One example was Isabel Lindsay, sister of Errol Lindsay. The golden sister of Errol Lindsay, Jer whatever your name is, Satan. I'm mad. This is how you act when you are out of control. I don't want to ever see my mother have to go through this again. Never, Jeffrey. Jeffrey, I hate you. On 
on May 1st, 1992, he pled guilty to the murder of Stephen Hicks, which resulted in an additional life sentence. In prison, Dahmer was kept in segregation for a year due to the administration's concern that he might harm other inmates. Eventually, he integrated with the rest of the prison population and was well behaved. November 28, 1994. An inmate named Christopher Scarver had it in for Jeffrey Dahmer. Dahmer would arrange his food to resemble dismantled body parts. It was done as a joke, but Scarver was far from amused. Scarver hated white people and was aware Dahmer mostly murdered men of color. He, Dahmer, and another inmate were on work detail, cleaning the prison's gym. When he asked Dahmer if he did indeed commit the crimes for which he was notorious and convicted, Jeffrey confirmed it was true. Scarver picked up a 20-inch dumbbell bar. He clubbed Dahmer several times on his face and head. When Dahmer fell to the floor, Scarver kept striking him until his head was beaten to a bloody pulp. Scarver attacked the other inmate and killed him in the same fashion. Scarver told a guard that God told him to do it. Jeffrey Dahmer died in hospital that day. Jeffrey Dahmer's mother, Joyce, gave a statement about his death to the media. Now is everybody happy? Now that he's bludgeoned to death, is that good enough for everyone? It probably wasn't good enough for the families of the victims. After all, Dahmer's remains were likely afforded more consideration and dignity than he bestowed upon the men he killed. Thank you for listening to Human Monsters. Bye for now.